everyone. Thank you so much for joining. My name's Rowena Rosati. I'm here to welcome you all for what is going to be a very compelling discussion leading inclusion this morning. Uh, I'm here representing uh, Surrey Board of Trade as a board director. Also, I'm the vice president of healthcare and innovation for the Health and Technology District. And also wearing the hat of a co-founder for Startup Surrey. Uh, I want to acknowledge that we are attending today from the treaty territory of the Chwasan First Nations and the unceded territory of the Kwantlen, Katsi, and Semiamu First Nations. Surrey Board of Trade, as many of you know, is Surrey's business organization. Uh, supporting businesses, helping businesses to succeed, being advocates at all levels of government, and being an overall resource and concierge for the business community, not only for existing businesses across Surrey, but also for new businesses uh, looking to, to come and grow in Surrey. As I mentioned earlier, I'm very pleased to start up Surrey as an entrepreneurial community that we have started in Surrey through the support of the Surrey uh, business community and Surrey Board of Trade. And we're thrilled to be a co-sponsor here today, building, strengthening the entrepreneurial community across Surrey. And I hope many entrepreneurs are participating in our discussion today. That's gonna to be so vitally important uh, for our communities, for our businesses. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Sean McEwen, who is going to lead and facilitate our discussion today. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, nice to be connecting with people in BC, my favorite province in Canada. I do a lot of mountain biking uh, out in the, in the Kootenays and um, absolutely love the province of British Columbia. Um, I'm here this morning on behalf of Hire for Talent, which is a business development corporation out of uh, New Brunswick. Um, it is their agenda to help build workplace sustainability uh, in Canada so that businesses can be sustainable um, and, and help businesses understand uh, some coming workforce demographic trends that we need to be apprised of and, and stay on top of. Um, so the, the focus of this workshop is on actually hiring people with disabilities uh, for the simple reason that that group can have a pretty profound impact on workplace diversity and inclusion for a business. And as I said, that's something that's gonna matter more as time goes by. So these are some of the things that we're gonna cover this morning uh, in this workshop. We'll be exploring workplace diversity and inclusion through the lens of disability. Um, again, that's a demographic that can bring a lot of capacity building to employers. So the objectives of this presentation and discussion and questions, and please do feel free um, to jump into the chat and submit questions there. Um, my colleague from Hire for Talent, Jolene, um, will be, will be um, letting me know when there are questions and reading some of those to me. Uh, so that we can we can address those as we go along. A uh, quick little bit about myself. I'm a diversity and inclusion consultant. I'm based out of Calgary, a director with Realized Capacity Consultants. I'm also a service provider. So I also uh, work for Gateway Association in Calgary and help employers connect with diverse talent groups, uh, including youth with disabilities, Indigenous people, etc. So the objectives of this um, presentation to help give everybody a deeper understanding of workplace diversity and inclusion. Diversity and inclusion are related, but they are not the same things. We're going to talk about that and we'll talk about why inclusion is so important. Why is this this buzzword of inclusion? Why does it matter so much? So help you understand that. Um, also want to help you understand sustainable workforce strategies and some of those coming trends. Uh, would like to identify some common ground between what employers really want and need from new hires and what service providers are trying to achieve when they're helping you source talent. And we'll also identify some strategies for effective collaboration to achieve our, our very mutual and common goals. So hopefully this workshop will become a great opportunity for us to explore these things and to continue a dialogue. I know that there are some service providers uh, present at this presentation. 
as well as many businesses. If you are a service provider, um, please feel free to give your contact information somewhere, uh, either in the chat or to the meeting hosts, so that employers can connect with you and, and find you uh, should they so desire after this presentation. This is the main thing I want to talk about, that the workplace inclusion of people with disabilities can help future-proof your business. And I, I know that's not something you may have considered. It might not even be something that service providers in the room have always thought about. But the evidence to support this concept is increasing every year. Workplace inclusion of people with disabilities can help future-proof your business. Why is that? Why, is, why can people with disabilities help? So this is where we're going to start. We're going to start with um, the main reasons that diversity and inclusion matter. So sustainable workforce development, positive workplace culture and performance, attracting new talent, and enhancing your company brand, especially as the diversity of customers increases. And Canada's diversity is increasing pretty rapidly and it will have to increase over the next 10 to 15 years in order to maintain our workforce. We'll talk about that right away. So right now, Across the globe, 60% of people are living in countries with stagnant or shrinking workforces. Essentially, um, people are just not as active as they used to be when it comes to having babies. So what's happening is we're aging out of the workforce faster than replacement workers are coming in. So over the next 10 to 15 years, over 25% of Canada's workforce will age out. That's gonna leave a gap of about 5 million workers. And the only way that Canada can fill that gap is, is through immigration and untapped talent pools. So diversity. Diversity is going to not be a nice thing in the future of work. It's gonna be a mandatory critical thing for business survival. Diversity, inclusion, and workplace culture will all factor into job choices. They already do, particularly for younger generations. But in the future of work, 10 years from now, when we've lost so many of our workers to aging out, who will be the employers of choice as we enter that future of work, which will, will be comprised of a job seekers market? Who will be the employers of choice? Who will be the employers that people wanna work for? We know that this change is coming and we know that we're going to have to adapt. And 10, 15 years might seem like a long way off, but any of us who are uh, my age or older knows that 10 or 15 years can go by pretty quick. And responding to these coming demographic changes and developing sustainable workforce strategies are things that take time. So starting sooner rather than later will position your business very well to be able to attract talent and, and be an employer of choice when it becomes a real job seekers market. These are some basic stats from uh, federal government and the Conference Board of Canada. Um, again, 25% of people will be aging out, uh, leaving a worker to retiree ratio of four to one. Uh, and in 15 years, it will be two to one. That's, that's an awful lot of retired people um, and an awful lot of workers that are required to be working and paying into CPP to maintain our whole CPP system. This is why the federal government invests so much and provincial governments for that matter, why they're investing so much in diversity and inclusion. Um, you know, it's, it's not necessarily an altruistic thing. It's, it's more a matter of keeping our workforce going and keeping our economy going. When it comes to people with disabilities, um, only about 59% of Canadians with disabilities aged 25 to 64 are employed compared to 80% of Canadians without disabilities. I would consider those stats pretty generous. It has typically hovered around 50% employment for people with disabilities. Um, they also earn less. There are, there are definitely some barriers there. When we talk about barriers uh, that people with disabilities face when it comes to, to work, we're talking about barriers to accessing employment. We're talking about things like not having as big a network as the rest of us might have, um, being able to transport oneself to job interviews, having the accommodations that are necessary um, to apply online, to go to job interviews. Those are the things that service providers are helping people do. In terms of actual working, People with disabilities don't face barriers there. They face barriers to accessing employment, not to working. And I think it's also worth 
having a quick conversation just about disability and what disability is, it's very, very easy for us to make assumptions about what disability is. And typically people immediately go to a person in a wheelchair um, or a person with Down syndrome. Well, those are, those are two of over 300 different types of disabilities that can affect people. Um, there are visible, in, visible disabilities, invisible disabilities. Um, they can include things like medical disabilities related to diabetes or uh, congenital disorders that pass down through a family. Um, it can be mental health issues, the absolute mind-blowing prevalence of anxiety disorders in young people is, uh, in this day and age. That is a significant factor in the increase in disability right across the planet. Um, learning disabilities, uh, neurodivergence, people who are on the spectrum, uh, autism, Asperger's, there's so many different types of disabilities. And the one thing that I've learned over an entire career of working with people with disabilities is don't, don't make any assumptions about what people can or can't do. Uh, disability does not impact a whole person, it impacts a part of the person. People with disabilities are still bringing the same kind of passion, talent, and, and good positive attitude to the table that we want in good employees. So please don't consider that you know exactly what disability is. Um, I've been doing this for my whole career and I get surprised by, by people and by um, different strengths that certain disabilities can bring to the table. Um, I spoke about anxiety disorder as well. Yeah, people might struggle a little bit with um, social pressures at work, but something else an anxiety disorder can do for people is make them incredibly focused at their work and incredibly diligent about doing a good job. So think of disability as maybe something that presents a barrier to accessing em employment, but something that in the right context is almost a superpower. That's what I would like to say about disability really quickly there. Um, so as these workforce demographic changes are occurring and as we look at, okay, how do we get better at diversity and inclusion faster? The group that we're talking about here, folks with disabilities, the reason they should matter most to employers is that this group, especially when combined with employment service providers can offer employers a way to hack diversity and inclusion. We'll talk more about that, but first let's talk about some coming gaps in our workforce. We're gonna talk a little bit about immigration. Um, I know we're here to talk about disability, but in fact, what we're thinking is that hiring people with disabilities makes you a lot better at diversity and inclusion right across the board. And we'll show you some evidence of that. So with 5 million people set to retire in the next 15 years, um, the replacement group, as said, will be comprised of newcomers and groups that are currently underrepresented. The other groups that are going to be a really big part of our workforce are millennials and Gen Z. Both of these are, are younger generations that statistically care a great deal about diversity and inclusion and healthy workplace cultures. Healthy workplace cultures involve inclusion. So we're going to talk for a, a little bit about inclusion, about workplace cultures, and about employee engagement. So when we think about workplace culture um, and try and break that down into a succinct definition, workplace culture is made up of the collective values, beliefs, assumptions, and habits that form the rules for working together. And it's very much about behavior. Um, you can have policies, you can have protocols, you can have expectations, but at the end of the day, whatever you allow to happen at work, whatever you tolerate at work, um, those are the things that, that become your workplace culture, whether you like it or not. So culture is really, it's learned and it's shaped through interaction and people. And a very, very important foundational element of healthy workplace culture is inclusion. Good company culture increases employee engagement and profit. Unfortunately, most of our businesses, even in the nonprofit sector, most of our, our workplaces are, are really busy doing the core purpose work, often too busy doing the core purpose work to give a lot of time and attention to things like strategy and culture. But as it turns out, 
paying attention to workplace culture, paying attention to how people feel at work can actually really impact heavily on how effectively your core purpose work is being achieved. Workplace culture can help your business speed towards growth, innovation, and profit, or worst case scenario, in a, in a bad, bad situation, workplace culture can be a ball and chain that holds a business back from achieving its potential. So in a good way workplace culture, you've got high levels of engagement. And we have good news and bad news about engagement stats in Canada. Um, Canada has one of the highest, highest engaged workforces on the planet. Um, the bad news is that's only about 31% of us. So statistically, when surveyed across the board, about 31% of Canadian employees identify themselves as very engaged at work, and 69% of employees identify as not engaged or actively disengaged. These are well-researched, measurable statistics on the engagement of employees. And I would like to, to have you consider what would be the impact um, of flipping these stats? What if 70% of your employees were engaged versus 30. What would that do for your profit? What would that do for growth, innovation, sustainability? That, that's what we're, we're working towards when we talk about a healthy workplace culture. So a healthy workplace culture, one that understands inclusion and a strengths-based employment approach, that has a significant impact on engagement and productivity. And when we're doing things that are disincentives to engagement, it's really a liability to our business. So this, this is where inclusion matters so much. What are some of the benefits of higher engagement? An awful lot of them. So this is from the State of the Global Workplace report conducted by Gallup in 2017. The study was done all over the planet um, with a minimum of 1.8 million employees surveyed to come up with these statistics. So with higher levels of employee engagement, you've got higher customer metrics, higher productivity, higher sales, and higher profitability, and you've got reductions in all the bad things. So lower absenteeism, lower turnover, all of these kinds of things. It's, this is a very important factor, engagement at work. And one of the single greatest ways to jack employee engagement is through a healthy and inclusive workplace culture. Attracting new talent. This is another reason diversity and inclusion matter. Millennials and Gen Z will comprise over 70% of our workforce in the next four years. That 70% of people in the workforce are from younger generations that statistically care more about diversity and inclusion. So when you are trying to attract talent, this is the group that is going to be the primary group that you are trying to reach. And we know what matters to them. As our workforce ages out, we've also got compounding factors around creating a job seekers market, including the gig economy, um, which honestly has been so accelerated by COVID. Our use of information and communications technology has been increased by as advanced and accelerated by as much as a decade um, during COVID. So um, I think the gig economy is going to become even more relevant. And I already know of people in Canada uh, who are working in Ottawa, but live in Thunder Bay. Um, actually, the work that I'm doing right now is from my home in Calgary. And here we are in Surrey this morning. Um, so being employers of choice in the future of work is a significant element of what we need to achieve as employers, as businesses, as any entity that seeks to attract employees. We need to be considering how will we attract new talent? What are the things that new talent really care about? Again, I'm going to come back to this core purpose work. Um, core purpose work and the work activities that produce our, our company outputs, whether that's goods or services, that is using up a lot of our time. And we really do need to take a little bit of time, um, whether that's a committee, whether it's partnering with local service providers, we need to engage in attentional kind of repetitive strategy development process 
to look at how can we increase diversity and inclusion at work? How do we get those outcomes? Um, because it takes time, because it takes consideration and learning and effort and even, even a bit of courage, because it requires all of those things, it is something that needs to be built into a, a strategy development process. It's really easy for our ideas and our goals to remain in the realm of the theoretical if we don't take action towards them. So this is something that collaboration and direct experiential learning can help with. And that's something that can, can really be achieved well through uh, partnerships with service providers. So we, we will discuss that a little bit. I just want to look through this. Um, yeah, Im implementing things within work routines. That's a, that's a big factor too. There's two ways that we learn at work and one is through social learning and the other is through work routines. So if we're doing, if we're embedding things in work routines that help us um, with diversity and inclusion or help us with healthy workplace culture or inclusive workplace culture, that, that can be very helpful too. So for the moment, let's talk a little bit more about diversity and inclusion. Diversity is real simple. Um, it, <laughs> it involves um, simply having a diverse range of people. And we've got some slides that define it a little bit better. This is, this is a, a graph or a, an image that is supposed to define diversity and inclusion. And uh, this, the reason I include it is to point out the flaw in it and the flaw of our thinking. So this is defined as inclusion. And the truth of the matter is, that's diversity, that's representation. All of the different colored dots, that's representation at work. Um, some of these other things are what actually can end up happening. So having all of these different diverse folks at work can be great, but if you have in groups and out groups, if you have people whose voices matter more than others, then you've actually got something that looks a little bit more like this, a little bit more like exclusion or segregation or integration, where you've got a group of people that aren't that are sticking together, but they don't have the, the same level of voice and impact and value at work as other people. The reason I think this is also flawed is because inclusion is really about how people are feeling at work. Are they feeling valued? Are they feeling welcomed? Are they feeling like um, this is a healthy place for them to be and like they're treated well? And when we're just looking at a picture of dots, we really, really have no idea how the dots feel, let's face it. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But I wanna say a, a quote that I've come across, some say that diversity is about counting people and inclusion is about making people count. And another diagram, this is actually the recipe that uh, people need to use for a diversity and inclusion framework. It is of course not. This is just meant to illustrate how complex workplace diversity, inclusion, and shifting workplace cultures can feel. And I think a lot of employers really are looking for some kind of formula for success. And, and we have a bit of that to talk about. There is a framework that people can use, but generally speaking, this is, this is a bit of a journey and it helps to start that journey early and it helps to have some collaborators uh, on that journey. Most employers really understand clearly what diversity is, and they understand that it's supposed to lead to innovation and profit and resilience. Um, but understanding the reasons and benefits behind DNI, although important, you really need to know how to implement strategies and get results. And this is where the highly underestimated uh, group of people with disabilities and the service providers that represent them um, need to be enlisted, I think. Service providers are very much on the flip side of this equation. Service providers are constantly doing the how part of diversity and inclusion. Service providers are um, building the, the self-awareness and the knowledge and the skills of job seekers, and then very, very, surgically figuring out what are the job targets that make the most sense for this person based on their strengths, assets, and passions. And then we're matching, we're talent matching 
those job seekers to the employers that need them the most. We're also, as we're bringing them into a workplace, helping to ensure that the processes, the mentoring, the training, the communication is all working to get the very most out of that person. And that is the how part of inclusion that service providers can make this whole ugly, whatever this even is, I don't know if it's a weather model or a math equation or what, but make it all a little bit more simple for employers. So diversity, race, sexual orientation, religion, gender, age, disability, pretty straightforward stuff. The thing that really matters though, is the diversity of thought and experience that people are bringing forward. That, that diversity of thought and experience allows people to solve problems that, that are sometimes problems we haven't even thought about yet. And we're focusing on disability as diversity because they can bring that diversity of thought to the table. Um, this, is, this is something that's worth considering that very often people with disabilities are confronted with barriers and it's caused their whole life experience uh, to have problem solving uh, as, as part of daily existence. People with disabilities have been solving problems their whole lives that the rest of us haven't even had to think about. Inclusion, on the other hand, very different. A strong sense of belonging, a feeling of being heard, valued, and respected, um, indicators of which include having voice, opportunities, involvement in the same work and non-work activities as others, and it's a factor that improves engagement for everyone. Humans are a very interesting species. We, we really are so deeply rooted in, in social relatedness and how people are getting treated that it's a, it's a known truth that even witnessing behavior that is not inclusive actually can, can disengage employees who aren't even victims of that behavior. Just merely witnessing it can make you wonder, hmm, how much should I really trust this workplace? If that person can be treated badly, maybe I can be treated badly too. So inclusion is really also an indicator of psychological health and safety at work. And as we know, trends around workplace harassment, bullying, uh, healthy workplace cultures, that's starting to be something that more and more is getting regulated and legislated. And although it might seem heavy handed, there's a reason for it. And the reason is actually productivity. Um, you, your business will perform better, plain and simple, when people feel psychologically safe at work. So when we're talking about inclusion, we have to realize it is not some passive thing that just happens based on our goodwill and leadership's value for inclusion. Inclusion is really demonstrated through actions and behavior towards each other. It's an element of workplace culture that benefits all employees by helping them feel welcome, safe, and engaged. And people that aren't included just don't contribute as much. So this is something to be very considerate of. If you're bringing diverse people in the door and then not including them, you're not getting that diversity of thought. You're not getting their contributions to the same degree that you would if you did have a very inclusive workplace. And I know people get stuck on the word inclusion and I'm gonna simplify it for you right now. In order to fully understand inclusion, you need to look at the opposite of inclusion. You need to look at exclusion. So as we read through this slide, these words, think about feeling this way at work. Think about feeling exclusion, unvalued, alone, silenced, unwelcome, outcast. There are workplace cultures where people can feel this way. There are humans for whatever reason, and it is a flaw, in groups and out groups. And those in groups and out groups can be really hard on each other. And this whole concept of feeling inconsequential at work, um, feeling, feeling unwelcome at work, feeling unvalued at work, those are not things that increase our performance. If you think about an absence of inclusion and how it affects people, do we perform well under these circumstances? Do we give our best? Do we stay? 
when this is the way we feel at work, are we really giving our best to that workplace? And clearly not, we are not. These are the kinds of things that make people not show up for work, makes them not perform when they are at work. Um, they are also in some cases, in some workplaces where these things are really significant, um, can result in things like human rights complaints, lawsuits, stress leaves. I don't know if everyone knows this, but the research around stress leaves suggests that people that are leaving their workplace due to stress and taking a leave take longer to return to work, take longer to return to their previous performance than people who leave because they got cancer. That is a significant element of why um, we're seeing the legislation and, and uh, regulation that we are around workplace bullying, harassment, and healthy workplace culture. Inclusion really needs to be deeply embedded in our workplace culture, because if it's not, our organizations are paying for its absence. And the human brain is very much wired for inclusion. That is something we all really need. Our brains have evolved over four to seven million years to perceive social connections as essential to our survival. We literally survived as a species because we lived in groups and we're hardwired to perceive, perceive this relatedness with each other as safe and rewarding and to view exclusion as unsafe and threatening. And this is, this is the part of exclusion and inclusion that's really important to realize. It's not a matter of being tough or not being tough. It, it really is just how our brains evolved over the last four to seven million years. And when you take the world of work, when you take the last couple hundred years, there has not been a significant amount of brain evolution in the last 200 years versus the last four million years. So our brains still work kind of like we're cavemen and, and threat is still perceived in the same way. So. Um, some simple slight of a colleague at, at a board meeting, um, some dismissive behavior towards somebody at work, your brain reads that as a significant threat. And when you're under threat, you don't perform the same way anymore. So this is, this is the reason that inclusion matters so much, because it's what helps us perform. And again, even witnessing behavior that excludes our coworkers makes us lose trust and engagement in the workplace. And the worse the exclusion behavior is, the worse the impact is on the rest of us. So as an employer, as a business owner, you need to realize that allowing behaviors that are exclusionary to occur at work is actually a significant liability to your business. It, it will negatively impact your business's productivity and sustainability. This is why this stuff matters so much. Safe connections at work, absolutely vital for health and collaboration. Um, I'm going to skip the group exercise. I don't think that it works well in a, in a virtual setting. Um, if at any point, uh, this pandemic actually ends and we can see each other in person again, I would love to do this group exercise uh, with you together, but uh, we, we will skip it um, virtually. So essentially what we're saying is inclusion, it's a universal need and it's not some touchy feely word, it's just about people not feeling threatened and it's very easy for performance to be impacted by being threatened. Inclusion matters to all of us, whether we're a member of a diversity group or not. Um, and when we're included and, val and valued at work, we're generally fairly happy. Inclusion should not be taken for granted in a workplace. And this is something else we need to really uh, discuss and realize as leaders in a workplace, we're not having the same experience that other people are. So you can, you can own a business, you can be a leader within a business, and you can think our workplace culture is great. But how many times a year do you discover that, oh, actually, I thought everything was fine, but apparently these people are having issues with each other, and that's why she's not showing up for work, and that's why those people don't talk anymore. Um, people don't always show the, the leaders at work, the things that they show each other. There's, there, there can be a little bit of what's called lateral violence at work, but it very seldom gets passed up to the boss. Although 
you know, uh, if you have a happy, happy, healthy relationship with your colleagues, you might take a little bit of ribbing and, and goodwill abuse from them now and again. The kind of uh, barriers and, and abuse that happen at work are generally not seen and experienced by people that have higher levels of status. So this is why um, it's worth kind of assessing this, and I'll talk about some easy, free ways to assess it. Um, and it's also why hiring somebody with a disability uh, can help open our eyes to workplace culture a little bit. Hiring somebody with a disability for the first time takes us out of our comfort zone, diverts our attention to actions and protocols that include people and support their success. And ideally, that new found attention and action become habit. This is why hiring, mentoring, and accommodating an employee with a disability can really build a workplace's capacity to better hire, mentor, accommodate, and include all new employees, regardless of what diversity group they come from. Let's talk a little bit about something called universal design or inclusive design, because I think this is a concept that kind of helps simplify diversity and inclusion. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of different types of diversity, and that can seem overwhelming uh, to some, some employers. We need to remember, though, that despite all of these differences, we're all human. We, we, all, um, we all came from the same place. Our psychology is very, very similar. The whole concept of threat and reward, all, all humans experience that very, very similarly. Um, to varying degrees and severity, but basically our whole psychology is wired around threat and reward. So when it comes to inclusive design, uh, this is something that initially was about designing accessible physical spaces. And then people started thinking about, you know what, it's not just physical spaces, it's also about systems and protocols and the ways we communicate that um, if we do this in a certain way, it's accessible to everyone. So this is why I want to talk about this, because inclusive design uh, can be seen as strategies and protocols that work for every prospective diversity hire, because in the end, we are all people. And many individual accessibility and accommodation issues can be proactively addressed through inclusive design. And inclusive design Universal design, these are not hard things. I know they're, they're maybe new words to you, but they do not require a, a degree. They do not require you to take courses. A little bit of reading might help, but in, generally, in, in general, it's about a mindset. So inclusive design is about designing things, environments, and systems in ways that work for everybody. Uh, designing things to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible. It's more of a process, not necessarily a result. And a simple example of it is anytime you are purchasing equipment, deciding about new workspace, uh, writing a job posting, um, using an applicant tracking system, anytime you're designing anything at work or purchasing anything at work, if you ask yourself, who would be excluded by this? Who would be excluded by this environment, this equipment? this process, this system, if you have that kind of conversation, you start to train your brain to be creative and to think about the things that actually present as barriers. Because the truth of the matter is, we don't always see the barriers that we ourselves don't face. We have to put our minds in that place. So this is inclusive design, is thinking inclusively. When we're buying desks, don't don't buy desks that don't raise anymore. You know this this is these are some of the things I've learned. Um, make sure your your building is in a, an accessible accessible neighborhood with sidewalks and curb cuts. Um, make sure that if there's multiple stories to the building, that there is an elevator, that there's ramps, um, automated door openers, and all of these things serve everyone. We'll we'll talk how. Um, so. Inclusive design, although it, it might take you some time to kind of train yourself to think this way and avoid 
uh, avoid unnecessarily creating accessibility issues, although it might take some time to, to do that, we get good at things by practicing them, not just by thinking about them. So it's the kind of thing that you can start to implement this tomorrow. Anything that you're designing, job description, posting, equipment, et cetera. Um, this is also the kind of creative thinking that service providers have to do all the time uh, when we're helping new employees or employers with onboarding, training, and retention processes. This is the kind of thing that service providers actually kind of do for you or with you collaboratively that, that teaches you how to do it. Um, it's also the kind of creative thinking that workplaces start to engage in and do all the time after they hire uh, and employ and retain a person with a disability. Disability inclusion trains inclusive environments and cultures. This slide, I know it says equality versus equity, but it's another tricky slide. It's not actually designed for this. Um, it's designed to point out what inclusive design actually looks like. Um, so in the first image, we're seeing how somebody is, it needs an accessibility uh, accommodation. In the second slide, we're seeing what that accessibility accommodation is. In the third slide, we're seeing none of that work would ever be required if we just did it right to begin with and designed something inclusively that worked for everyone. So that's all this is meant for is just to give an example a visual example of inclusive design other examples might include things like automated door openers um, hired a guy who is quadriplegic and realized how inaccessible our workplace was we put in automated door openers around the building so um, so our colleague could get around and immediately noticed that people carrying two cups of coffee, people carrying heavy boxes of files, they would hip check the door openers. We realized that, oh, these things get used by everyone. Same with the wheelchair ramps in a busy shopping mall. Um, I don't remember the last time I saw a person in a wheelchair using a ramp in a shopping mall. I definitely have seen parents with strollers, uh, elderly people, um, people with recent injuries, walking on crutches. Um, so those are the kinds of things that that sort of show what inclusive design is. Um, even things like Siri, just uh, the voice activation uh, software on your phone. And I don't know if you know this, but this meeting format, uh, Zoom, Microsoft Teams, all of those things have extensive accessibility uh, elements built right into them. So think about examples of products, devices, or systems designed for accessibility that you yourself use frequently. These are things that initially started as accessibility, but now have just become inclusive design. Some ways that we can use inclusive design at work around employment specifically. So just thinking about employment accessibility, um, think about the concept of when you're phoning candidates when you're phoning applicants um, to advise them you'd like to interview them, what if you had an inclusive interview process or uh, an interview accommodation process where you said, we have a policy that says we have to tell you about the interview and you are allowed to ask for accommodations for that interview and you will not be denied the interview for asking for accommodations. So our interview is gonna be a three person panel interview that's on the second floor of a walk-up building and has a 30 minute long Microsoft Excel test at the end. That gives a person who might have a disability that you don't know about because you're just calling them on the phone, gives them a, an opportunity to to, to state, actually, I, I do need an accommodation for that. I have a mobility disability, um, or um, I have uh, an accommodation requirement around, around the Microsoft Excel test. I can absolutely do that, but I would need a longer period of time to do it because I only have one arm, or I have a fine motor skill, uh, medical-based disability. Those are things that, A, would allow you to avoid any awkward situation when the person shows up, B, allow a person to have the accommodation they need for you to really determine, are, are they able to do this job and are they bringing the, the kind of talent we need to the table? 
and C, it lets people know really clearly that you're a workplace that cares about diversity and inclusion. Very simple process, just having a little policy and uh, implementation around that. There are many elements of inclusive design that are really just basic best practices at work around onboarding and communication. So when it comes to employee orientation, because people learn work through that combination of work routines and social learning, making sure that there's intentional mentorship, pairing somebody up, buddy system, whatever you need to do to make sure that there's daily, hourly opportunity for social learning at work. That is something that will work for every single person you hire, but it works very well for any sort of diversity group to make sure that that social learning is in place. Because sometimes when you hire diverse groups, the social learning kind of gets shoved down a little bit because the person is different in some way, people kind of withdraw a little bit. That is a guaranteed way to make sure it takes longer for that person to perform. So think hard about what can you do to make sure mentoring and social learning is always in place at work. A healthy workplace culture and psychological health and safety, a workplace that has inclusion, all of those things are considered inclusive design. Cultural agility, recognizing as a leader, as a recruiter, as a person who supervises people, realizing that different people are going to face different barriers than you. If you're a man supervising a woman, that woman is absolutely facing a whole different range of barriers that you are likely unaware of. Same with people with disabilities, same with people from other cultures. So it's important to realize, although you yourself might not face those barriers, they're very real for the people that are experiencing them. Um, emotional intelligence, basic awareness of yourself and your biases, um, keeping an eye out for micro inequities, you know, um, sometimes you'll see three person panel interview people that all know each other, and someone walks into the room uh, for an interview, and only one person in your three person panel interview makes eye contact with them or shakes their hand. That might not seem like a big deal to you because you're safe and happy and healthy with that group. But for somebody who's new and experiencing what really does amount to low level threat, meeting new people, that, that can be a little bit debilitating and maybe won't let them perform as well at that interview as they otherwise could have. And we're looking for the best talent. We're not looking for the most confident interviewers. We're looking for the best people for the jobs we're offering. So this actually serves us. We might think of it as something we're doing to accommodate someone else, but we're actually just performing better at recruiting people when we do things like this. Clear leadership and expectations, making sure that communication and expectations are super clear, written down, having, having training plans for every new hire. So many things that we can do that are just basic best practices that represent inclusive design. So um, service providers as well. I'm gonna keep pitching service providers all day long because I think they're a vastly underestimated resource for employers, uh, but service providers can really help you become familiar with inclusive design. Um, and you'll likely find all of your non-disabled employees thanking you for it in the end. Thinking differently is a good start. But again, we need to take these good ideas and apply them. We need to embed new knowledge into real work routines. I wanna talk a little bit about accessibility and psychological health for the simple reason, uh, just like there's a, a growing trend in terms of uh, 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 reduction in our workforce, there's also trends around legislation and regulation uh, around accessibility and psychological health. And the reason I'm pointing this out is simply so you're aware of it, that this is, this is a growing trend. It's an upward trend, not a downward trend. And so I think it, it's a, a good idea to get on the right side of this sooner rather than later um, and to, to ensure that we're moving in a direction that as those trends continue, uh, we're not trying to catch up to them. We're ahead of the curve on them. So the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, that's a global kind of legislation, voluntary uh, legislation that Canada has subscribed to and signed on to. Um, and Article 27 within that convention 
uh, is all about work and employment and how uh, Canada as a country, uh, as a state party that signed on to this convention, Canada is, is, needs to ensure that workplaces are accessible and inclusive of people with disabilities. Um, a few years ago, the Accessible Canada Act came out um, that seeks to create a barrier-free Canada through the proactive identification, removal, and prevention of barriers to accessibility. Um, right now, that legislation is very specific uh, to federally funded industries and industries under federal jurisdiction. Um, the National Standard on Psychological Health and Safety in the Workplace, this came out, I'm going to say about seven years ago. Um, it's a voluntary standard that I believe someday will just become part of occupational health and safety because we're already seeing that at a provincial level an increase in the language around psychological health and safety uh, combined with harassment and bullying and things like that. Um, there's also an amazing resource that came out of this. So uh, out of the National Standard on Psychological Health and Safety in the Workplace, um, there was a project that was uh, a collaboration between the federal government, uh, what used to be called Great West Life, I believe now is Sun Life, and the Mental Health Commission of Canada. And they designed this amazing platform called Guarding Minds at Work. Uh, again, Guarding Minds at Work. Uh, if you do nothing else today, Google Guarding Minds at Work when we're done. Um, Guarding Minds at Work is a workplace culture self-assessment, and um, it walks employers through, here's the communication to send out to your employees, here's the link to the survey that they can do, and it gives you this aggregated third-party anonymous report where all of your employees have responded to this survey, and it rates your workplace culture on 13 psychosocial indicators. I know, big ugly word. It's just, it rates you on things like clear leadership and expectations, recognition and reward, civility and respect, all these things in your workplace. And you can see how your employees are actually viewing your workplace. What do they think of your workplace culture? Which is a very good assessment because leaders don't often see the whole culture. Um, so aside from, just giving you uh, ratings and, and letting you know visually where you're at uh, in your workplace culture. It also, for any segment that you're not doing well on, it gives you a list of like 20 plus things you could do to improve your ratings and improve your performance in that area. So any employer can look at that list of recommendations and decide uh, recommendations three, eight, and 12, those ones look easy for us to do. Let's start there. So it gives you even a little bit of a game plan to improve the situation. I've been through a Guarding Minds at Work assessment twice at work, and both times it was very valuable to the workplace culture, and I would highly recommend it. And no, I don't get paid from Guarding Minds at Work. Um, let's continue on. So we've come to the part of this presentation where we can actually talk about a framework for diversity and inclusion success for employers. And there's three things that really matter. And please consider these just subtitles for the following slides. The three things that really matter are growth mindset, intentional workplace culture, and collaborative and experiential learning. We've talked a little bit about how to facilitate intentional workplace culture, specifically around the guarding minds at work stuff that helps, talked about um, collaborating with service providers. Let's talk about growth mindset and what that exactly means. So very simple, um, growth mindset simply means that you understand there's something that you don't know as much about as you need to, but you believe that you have the capacity, that your workplace, you and your colleagues, absolutely have the capacity to learn and apply uh, new knowledge. So fixed mindset is kind of the opposite of that, the belief that you already know everything you need to know and everyone else is the one that needs to fit in. I wish you luck in the future of work if that's how your, your mind is working right now. 
um, growth mindset is really critical to culture change in the workplace. And as it turns out, growth mindset is the first thing required for workplace diversity and inclusion progress to be made. We first have to admit there are things that we don't know about uh, that we need to learn about or do differently. And what, we, what, what do we believe? What do we as a workplace believe about our capacity to learn, collaborate, and apply new knowledge? Um, do we believe in the value of diversity and inclusion? Do we understand that there are things that we don't currently know but need to? All of that is growth mindset kind of stuff. Intentional workplace culture, again, we talked about how people who have actual or perceived power in a workplace don't necessarily see the whole workplace culture or experience the barriers that others do. So this is why assessment is really valuable. Leadership plays a huge role in shaping workplace culture for better or worse. It does take courage or strength to be vulnerable, to ask everyone, hey, what can I be better at? But you know, that, that's why leaders get a different pay scale. Um, you have to be a culture champion and you have to look at what's getting measured, what's, what's getting rewarded here. Um, you have to look at what are the team norms that we want to establish? What's the behavior that we want to establish at work? Because these things actually preserve your performance. These, these aren't nice things to do anything or nice things to do anymore. Uh, it's not about being ethical. It's not about being moral. Um, yes, all of those things are important. I'm not denying that they're important. But what I'm saying is this, this isn't soft skills anymore. It's business survival strategies at this point. We know the coming demographic cha changes are going to create a job seekers market. And we have to get better at this stuff. So given that learning at work is all about work routines and social learning, those things can also be used to help shift culture. And as we hire and onboard a person with a disability, for instance, um, it typically causes a workplace to really think about things like work routines and social learning. And it causes us to pay an unprecedented amount of attention to the onboarding, training, and communication processes wherein our current strengths and flaws get exposed. So there's even to, to some degree, there's an element of workplace assessment that can be gained just by hiring a person with a disability. And that resulting clarity absolutely can be used to create changes that benefit all employees, including any new diversity hires. Collaborative experiential learning. This is very interesting stuff. I'm really enjoying uh, elements of neuroscience as applied to work. If any of you are really into reading and want to know more about the neuroscience and work, this, I'm just, and again, I don't get paid from these folks. It's just a book I really like. Um, so Your Brain at Work, I'm hoping you can see this, Your Brain at Work by David Rock. Um, the David Rock is also a member of something called the Neuro, Le Neuro Leadership Institute. And I believe it is just neuroleadership.com is their website. It is chocked full of amazing neuroscience-based diversity and inclusion tips and tricks for employers. Um, please, please give them a visit because they have some amazing stuff there. So when it comes to collaborating, the reason collaborating is a really good idea is because it accelerates our learning. It's a faster way to get traction and progress in diversity and inclusion. Collaborative or experiential learning activates more of our brain for problem solving. Uh, it excites us, it increases resources, ideas, and perspectives. And neuroscience tells us that effective collaboration, such as the kind of collaboration that can happen between service providers and employers, uh, it actually releases oxytocin and dopamine, the exact same happy chemicals that dancing or hugging, hugging a loved one releases. So it actually feels good and in doing so increases our commitment, our engagement, our attention and our performance at facilitating whatever it is we're collaborating on. Action or experience builds our capacity faster than just thinking about things and teaches us much more. So the intentional formal collaboration of service providers and employers really holds enormous potential for diversity and inclusion results and has generally been overlooked thus far as an effective strategy 
in making real progress in diversity and inclusion at work. So really, really what I'm what this whole presentation about is about is um, the value that people with disabilities bring to the workforce in terms of creating that traction on uh, on workplace diversity and inclusion. And the the fact that the time has really arrived, given the coming workforce trends and all of these free publicly funded service providers. That's the other thing. Please note as an employer, zero cost. All of the investment comes from the federal or provincial government. Um, there is no cost to partnering with service providers, um, to getting talent through them. And I'm not suggesting that partnering with a service provider means you absolutely have to hire someone, but it definitely means you should interview someone. It definitely means you need to start building your capacity to interact with diversity and build your capacity to include diversity. So at the very least, think about every time you're hiring, are you communicating that you are interested in having applications from diversity groups or people with disabilities? Are you connecting with service providers to say, hey, we have these openings, interview people, if you don't think they're the right person for the job, don't hire them. But most of the people that we are representing as service providers, we know that they're going to sell themselves. They have the experience, they have the passion and enthusiasm that you're looking for. And really they're just looking for interviews. That is a place we can collaborate just to book interviews for people. Um, disability in general, uh, can have a very profound uh, impact on the workplace that, again, is kind of unknown and underestimated. So what does that bring? Well, when you hire people with disabilities, you end up having a, a demonstrable, visible, inclusive workplace culture that's attractive to other talent pools. Um, you end up with motivated, engaged employees and improved morale, lower staff turnover, enhanced brand, increased productivity, profit, innovation, and safety. All of these kinds of things can help. Again, diversity and inclusion really matter to younger generations and to other diversity groups. So there, there are benefits here that hiring people with disabilities really communicate to other disability or other diversity groups. Um, disability very frequently impacts positively on staff morale and employers are consistently making statements to service providers who maybe initially had some trepidation about hiring a person with disability and six weeks later they're saying he makes this a better place to work or I should have done this years ago or I, I need five more guys like this. These are the kinds of comments that we're constantly getting from employers when we're engaged in this kind of work. And unfortunately, service providers are not well resourced to do the kind of marketing and promotion that a lot of businesses are. Um, so we're not always communicating this. Um, that's, that's part of my pitch here is, is letting you know what service providers sometimes aren't letting you know. Um, if you do have the ability to connect with a service provider after this presentation, Ask them to share some of the positive comments they've heard from employers. Ask them for references. Ask them who are some other employers you've worked with that could speak to the quality of your work or the quality of the candidates that you represent. Like you don't, you don't need to um, treat service providers representing people with disabilities with kid gloves. We are, we are very able to provide all of the information. Um, so feel, feel free to push us a little bit in that regard. Other benefits of hiring people with disabilities? Well, we talked about a bunch of the main things in this uh, bar graph to the right. The one I'd like to draw your attention to is down in the bottom left corner. So if you look at this in 2019, the Institute for Corporate Prosperity, I4CP, uh, this is an American business-based uh, association. They studied uh, right across the United States, uh, a lot of businesses that were hiring people with specifically intellectual disabilities. <clears throat> and what came back was um, almost half the employers saying that there was a noticeable increase for them in their cu cultural competence right across their organizations as a result of disability inclusion education. So the things they learned by hiring people with disabilities and working with a service provider actually improved 
their diversity and inclusion capacity across all differences, such as race, gender, ethnicity, age, et cetera. This is what I'm talking about when I say hiring people with disabilities makes you better at all diversity. Let's talk a little bit about what service providers do, because some of that might be uh, something of a mystery to some of the businesses that, that haven't worked with a service provider before. So every service provider team that I've met, and I've met, I'm going to say over 100 service provider teams right across Canada, every service provider team has had a window into hundreds of workplace cultures. And in fact, I would assert confidently that service providers see more workplace culture than any other entity I can think of in Canada. Because of how we're involved in workplaces and how many workplaces we're involved in, how many workplaces we are either contacting or directly placing people into, consulting with employers around um, diversity and inclusion, because of the sheer volume of workplace culture, uh, into which we have insight and windows, we really see cultures that get or don't get inclusion, supervisory styles that work or don't, workplace accommodations, mentorship factors in employee engagement, retention, uh, onboarding and training methods, hiring and inclusion failure factors. All of these things are part of our daily, weekly, monthly, yearly experience. This is what we do for our careers. And it teaches us a lot that allows us to be able to help coach and uh, communicate with employers things they can do, uh, tips and tricks, um, strategies to improve workplace diversity and inclusion. Some of the things that we're doing directly with the job seekers we're serving, we're identifying their strengths, interests, and qualities. We're help matching those to job choices and then exploring uh, those job ideas. We're connecting people to occupational training, testing, and skills development where necessary, and identifying environments or accommodations that really help them shine. As well, educating them about work culture, employer expectations, and then facilitating matched employer introductions or interviews. Very often a service provider, if you want, or if the, we believe that the, the candidate needs this, we would actually attend the interview and help facilitate some conversations. Um, we, we, we will do everything we can as service providers to make an interview happen. But most importantly, we're bringing you a pre-screened talent matched candidate that we know for a fact wants to work for you. And that's not necessarily something you're getting through the other 200 people applying for your job. So those are just some of the services that job seekers with disabilities are receiving from service providers that benefit you as an employer. In terms of direct employer services, um, there's a number of things we're doing for you. And why we're worth talking to is that statistically, employers are failing at hiring in 46% of their recruitment endeavors. And I assure you, we do infinitely better than that. So what we're doing for you, talent sourcing and talent matching, interviewing and onboarding support, helping you design accommodations and performance improvement plans if necessary. And all of these things you can use with other people. The things that, um, that we're doing to help employers, employers just end up using them on an ongoing basis going forward. Um, providing diversity and inclusion resources and coaching. Um, helping, to, helping you to improve your workplace culture through disability inclusion. All of these kinds of things beyond facilitating talent matched employment um, we are building your capacity for a more diverse and inclusive workplace. My question is, what else could we be doing? If employers and service providers were having more candid conversations, what else could we be doing to serve you better based on our knowledge and expertise? I think the time has come for that dialogue. Gallup's 2017 State of the Global Workplace Report cites these human capital development factors as critical to improving business resilience, productivity, and growth. And it is worth noting that all service providers that, that I've ever worked with, these are absolutely things that we are addressing as part of our daily work with job seekers and employers. So there's an element of human capital development 
that we that can almost be outsourced to us. And I, I wouldn't say outsourced entirely because we'd really rather be collaborative about it. But there's there's a lot that that we're bringing to that table. Common ground and common goals. This is the thing that never ceases to amaze me. There is nothing a service provider, uh, nothing that we're looking for uh, as an outcome for the candidates we're serving that you aren't looking for. Our, our goals are 100% aligned. We're looking for great talent matches, work performance, engagement, social inclusion, people that really fit in at work, people having a valued role where they're independent and job retention. This is another thing that's so important. So many people with disabilities that service providers are working with, they're still there five years from now. They're still there 10 years from now, some of them. You know, that absolutely statistically higher employment retention rates for people with disabilities. So that's a nice short-term benefit. Um, the longer term benefit being just improving your workplace diversity and inclusion capacity. So facilitation of these common goals fills an important need for workplaces while enhancing the conditions for inclusion. How can we work more collaboratively? So these are the questions I would like to leave you with today. Um, this, this forms the basis for an ongoing dialogue uh, between employers and service providers. This is something that can really help you um, make, some, make some gains in workplace equity, diversity, and inclusion, um, having conversations based around what employers want and need from service providers, uh, really determining what are service, service providers able or not able to help with, um, what workplace inclusion questions do we have for each other? I know we're on we're on flip sides of the exact same coin, and uh, really have so much potential for engagement, collaboration to help people um, make the gains that support our our mutual outcomes. So. Please consider these. Please, if again, if you are a service provider and haven't put your contact information uh, in the chat or sent it to the meeting hosts, please do so. Um, I would also like to just mention the Hire for Talent website, um, which I'm going to actually stop sharing this and jump right in here. The Hire for Talent website has a ton of great resources for employers. Um, the website is simply hireforTalent.ca, hireforTalent.ca. Um, tons of uh, resources around disability inclusion, accommodations, uh, frequently asked questions. There's even a bunch, thank you Jolene for putting the website in the chat. Um, there are even some really good resources around hiring people with disabilities during COVID and what are some accessibility and remote working considerations uh, and information. It's truly a great, great resource that uh, in, had the involvement of service providers and I believe some employers from right across Canada. So just a treasure trove of information there. Um, Meeting hosts, uh, please let me know if I'm going over time. I'm just looking into the chat to see what do we have uh, in terms of questions. Uh, we had some pre-submitted questions. Where do you begin as an organization if there isn't any structure in place yet? I'd talk to a service provider okay. about that. Hi, Heather. So we're actually going to uh, stop there. Oh, okay. Uh, well, we will uh, send out some contact information. If anyone has questions, they can uh, respond back to you guys directly uh, with any questions to clarify. Uh, so I wanted to say thank you, Sean, for spending the morning educating us today. A recording of today's session and the presentation will be sent to all of the uh, attendees this morning. We have more great digital events scheduled as we head towards the summer. So check out businessinsurrey.com to see what's planned and make it a great business day, everyone.